being you, you're being pulled. How did, and you know you you started at you know with the Lubavitch yeshiva and you said you graduated and you knew you moved on to to what mm -hmm. was next. How did you know? Well, first of all, I didn't get into the Lubavitch yeshiva because I sat down and went on on the web to check out where I want to go. It was, again, each step of the way uh, led me. My internal thing coinciding with external uh, situation, bringing me in touch with the right people at the right time. So I feel that uh, I didn't choose Lubavitch. Uh, I was moved into the direction where I had no other choice but Lubavitch. You see, I wasn't interested stum to learn Gemore and uh, everything else. I was more interested in what happens when you daven. Lubavitch was the only place where they used to do something they called davenen ba'arichut, a meditational davenen. That's what interested me, you know. Watching the Rebbe Davim, I felt, ah, what a model this was for me, you know, well, uh, hanging out with the Hasidim. Because people think you can learn Davinin from uh, a book. You can't. You can learn Davin only from Daviners. So if you stand close to Daviners and your body begins to mimic in ways that you can't even, it's like biofeedback, but I would call it sociofeedback that when you are in a group of people and they're doing something, you get moved to it. And after a while, you know how to go there. But at first, I wouldn't have known how to go there. So I feel that the issue of divine providence is for me the proof of God, as it were, not because of philosophy, you know? I see. So your belief in God is based on, based on your experience? More, ex more on the experience. You ask, for instance, about the existence of God. The word exist philosophically has a meaning of something that's out there, that exists, ex ist, you know. And what a silly thing this is about talking about ein sof, memali kolal min sovif kolal min, the one who surrounds the world, who is, fills the world. I'm never outside of God. So to say God exists is not the right way. But if I want to go and use my mind to understand cause, effect, relationship, today even cosmologists are speaking about the anthropic principle, that from the Big Bang on to this moment it couldn't have happened unless creation had in mind to produce human beings. So here again you have a sense of the pull rather than the push, right? And so I think Yes, you can come up, uh, I often say, theology is the afterthought of the believer. First you believe, and then you start saying, how can my head wrap itself around what my soul knows? And so I create a theology. The people who try and in introduce you to theology first, without experience, you find you have an empty shell of mind stuff, but you don't have... I don't even want to say substance, the reality is missing. So do you think, though, for one who's never had the experience of God, can that person come to know God rationally, or is it totally useless to someone who's not a believer? I don't believe that there is anyone who hasn't had an experience of God. I'll give you an example. Two lovers are in the midst of making love, and when they're coming, they're screaming out, Oh, God! Yeah. <laughs> so, what is that? When uh, a person is in pain, they say, Oh, God, what's going on? The answer is that they get to the end of their uh, capacity of their own being, and the ego, as it were, for a moment, relinquishes its central space. And what is there then is that moment which is God. And people have had those moments. Uh, the problem is because the mind didn't know how to wrap itself around the experience and they didn't know how to hang out there, how to dwell there. So what happened for them is that they forgot the next moment. You see, uh, take a look. When people say to me, uh, uh, great experiences and so on and so forth, but they should change you. No, they don't. Even Mamet Har Sinai, we stood and heard God, and 40 days later we had a golden calf, you know. Uh, the experience alone 
won't do it if you don't later on put moral and spiritual and intentional kavana effort behind it. Um, that leads perfectly into my next question, which is, how tied is your, is your belief in God to your concept of morality and justice? It depends. Uh, when I teach about God, not only to others, to myself, I speak of four levels of the divine name, Yud, He, Vav, He. The bottom level is God the Creator, and I look at creation, and there are moments in creation when I feel I'm not separate from it, it's all one, and I call that experience, it is perfect. There's another level that hasn't got anything to do with creator and creation, but has to do with the sense of, I am with you and I love you. There's a second level uh, of the Vav of the Divine Name, which uh, I give the name, You Are Loved. Okay? There's another level, still higher, which is the mental level. And that level deals with how my conceptual framework manages to talk about God. And is it coherent? You know, does it make sense? It, I can't prove that it is true. I can only prove that it is coherent. And I call it, all is clear. Then there is a level where, as I talked before, the moment when ego steps aside and I know that the real I am is the I am that I am. And that is the one where I say, I am holy. That's the Yud of, of God's name. So I keep chanting with people, it is perfect, you are loved, all is clear, and I am holy. Because on that level, where I am holy, I'm dealing with intuition. On the level all is clear, I'm dealing with conceptual mind. On the level <coughs> of you are loved, I'm dealing with affect. And on, on the level of... Um, it is perfect, I'm dealing with the way in which everything works together. Metabolism, anabolism, you know, breath, in-breath, out-breath, how all this works is so amazing. Now, if you talk about God, I always have to ask the person, where are you meeting me when you talk about God? If you're talking about conceptual God only, good, we talk about concepts. But the concepts will be empty if they don't contain in itself the I am that I am. If we could go backwards for a minute um, to your saying that um, everyone has had experiences of God. So do you think belief is a choice? That, I mean, some people say, I, you know, I don't believe in God, but in, in, your, in your schema, everyone's had experiences of God. So are these people choosing? Yeah. Very often there is a problem. All right, I'll start again. Very often there is a problem uh, it, I'll exemplify it by a story. When I first came to Boulder, there was a teacher, Tibetan teacher, by the name of Chögyam Trungpa. It was Friday evening, and he was having a session, and I came dressed in my Shabbos clothes, Streimel, Kapote, you know. And um, he began to tease me in a way and said, uh, my kid asked me if there is a God, and I said no. And my kid said, am I glad, you know. And then he looked at me like, give me my rejoinder. And I said, sir, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. Because there are lots of people who have given, been given a childish notion of, first of all, that God is good to everybody and there won't be any evil in the world, you know? The first time they meet evil in the world, then the, then the God picture breaks for them, you know? They don't have a sense, like in the Daven, and we say, uh, You promised Yaakov that you would be with him in the fire and in the water. You didn't promise that you're going to uh, rescue him from the fire and the water, but when he burns or when he drowns, you'll be with him. A whole different way of thinking about God than the other way. So people have to give up childish ideas about God. And very often when they say, I don't believe in God, because if there was a God, why are children dying from AIDS? You know, 
Why are innocent people suffering? Because they had heard that God is the traffic cop and the judge, and he will take care of all these things and punish the bad guys, you know? And if you read certain sections in the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy, you get the sense. If you will behave, everything will be good, and if you don't behave, then I'll send you all kinds of tzaras and so on. So, in this immature way, uh, they get to a place where if it doesn't work, then they scrap everything about God. But, and this is wonderful, when I think about the time you asked the question about the moral stuff and the ethical stuff, I go back to the beginning of the 20th century, when there were so many people who threw away everything about God except to help the poor. And there were people who grew up uh, in homes of communists and socialists and used to call them the um, red diaper babies. I'll tell you a funny story. In Winnipeg, there lived a man, uh, he was a member of parliament. His name was Rabbi Gray. His real name was Gor Arya, but he had changed it to Gray. He ran for parliament on the socialist ticket, and he was uh, re-elected year after year after year because his district, there were Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, and they all knew that when you went to Moshe Gray, he would fix up whatever he could. One day he calls me up and says, Rav Zalman, uh, every year I give a talk in the parliament, and I say, uh, that I'm not a socialist for Marx, I'm a socialist for Isaiah. <laughs> yeah. So he said, but I'm tired to say Isaiah, maybe you can help me, I should be a socialist from Jeremiah, maybe. <laughs> you know? By the time he had graduated to being a socialist from Pirke Elvis, <laughs> which was so wonderful, because here you see, this guy would not come to shul except for Kiddush on Shabbos morning. And he would first go to the Schwitz with a friend, and after the Schwitz he would come uh, to Shul and make Kiddush with us and, and sing and do all this kind of stuff. This was his Yiddishkeit. But it showed itself in a way that if you asked him, what do you believe about God, he would say, I believe in Yosha, in, in equity. I believe in, in, in righteousness. That's how these people would talk. And I think uh, what they were doing is, how could I believe in a God that's being um, pushed by capitalists who are robbing the workers, you know? I usually get into the problem of evil a little bit later in the interview, but since it's come up now, how, how do you explain evil in the world? I mean, clearly, you know, according to everything you said, God never promised us that, you know, there wouldn't be evil, evil that bad things wouldn't happen. But how do we reconcile a, a belief in God and a love of God and a familiarity with God, a relationship with God, when God either causes or allows these terrible things to happen? That if a man did them, we'd say, you know, lock him up. <laughs> so much of the evil is what we set up. There is a posseg that says, your evil will punish you. Your evil is going to reprove you. If I were to take a look and see, you know, a lot of people think that they can get away with everything just because they say God or whatever, you know? We aren't finished yet with this president that we have today and all the stuff that he does to ruin the environment and, and to, to take money and to push it to Halliburton and uh, people don't get social security and so on and so forth. So there's an inequity, and if I look at this inequity, and then I look at the inequity that's happening uh, by the terrorists, and I look at the inequities that happen even for the Palestinians from our government in Israel, then I say, show me how much evil is left that you can blame on God. You know, when we talk about uh, uh, Nazis and Jews, Nazis used to think that we are not human beings, you know, we are vermin. And they used um, what you use to kill uh, vermin with, uh, Cyclone B gas. But we also had such a notion, oy oy oy, shikr is a goy, shikr is a trink miserable is a goy, he isn't quite a human being, and so on and so forth. So, you know, let's, f when we figure out all that, which happens to be evil that's brought on by human beings, then we can talk about catastrophes. 
And catastrophes are natural, whereas evil is something that is brought by being careless, by being hurtful, by being uh, vindictive, and so on and so forth. So I can't, I can't go with you on this, on this question. It me, and if I have a sense of God, not only as the one who creates, but also the one who suffers. In other words, you and I right now, we think, I think I'm Zalman, you think you're Sarah. But in reality it is God playing Sarah and God playing Zalman, because I didn't make myself, you're not making yourself, and so on. If you have a different notion of God, then the question falls away. Well, how do you think that, well, I'll ask a few things in response to that. First of all, you know, okay, so most evil, and I guess evil by, by definition, really, has to be done by man, otherwise it's, it's calamity, um, which I'd like mm -hmm, to mention in a minute. Mm -hmm. But um, man was created at Salam al -Akim. Pardon? Man was created at Salam al -Akim. Yeah. Yes. So how is it that we, created in God's image, have yeah. this horrible capacity? Well, let's take a look. We are created in God's image as far as the Nisham is concerned. But as um, Adin Stein once put it, uh, we sit in the gorilla's body. <laughs> okay? So uh, that's been the whole, the whole point of bringing the two of them together in a way that the goof, the body, is going to be able to listen to the Nishama. But there are some things that the Nishama doesn't know and she, the neshama needs the body. I once heard someone say, and that made a lot of sense to me, the soul gives to the body life, the body gives to the soul experience. You know, and so, yes, it is true, but if you understand selim alokim, most people don't get it. The word selim comes from the word sail, which means shadow, silhouette. And if you look, yud is like the head, Hay is like shoulders and arms. Vav is like the spine. Uh, pelvis and legs is like the other hay. So we are made with Selim Elohim in this way. But there's no guarantee at this point that the people who are made with Selim Elohim cannot abuse that. Okay, so turning to calamities of nature then, um, they're not, I understand that they can't be evil by, by definition, but how, but nonetheless, I mean, they're, they're unfortunate events and we, you know, we, we lament them. And we, yeah, you know, so yeah. How, do, first of all, do you think God causes these things or just allows them to happen? You always talk as if God is outside of, of the earthquake. If the tectonic plates are shifting, this means they're shifting in God, okay? If people are suffering, it means that God in those people is suffering. It's not, you know, that whole notion of seeing God as apart from creation is a basic misunderstanding. It's a mistake. It's taking it the wrong way. Every time we want to make God... Um, existing out there, you know, and up there sitting on a throne and watching the whole business and letting us poor uh, Schmigeg suffer, you know. Obviously the question comes up, but I think uh, what happens is that if I go deep into the suffering and I ask who suffers, then I come to our tradition saying, Uvitzaratam lo tsar, and the Shechina is suffering. Um. I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna push this a little. Go go um, go. Um, so if God, but if God is in in those rocks that fall in an avalanche, say, or the snow yeah. in Colorado, um, could God have prevented it in a sense? Could God still hold back from you know from allowing Himself in a sense to to cause the catastrophe? So let me finally try and put this together for you. Please. Because what keeps coming up all the time is God out there, and he could reach in and prevent the whole situation, okay? We used to have that model that was the industrial model, or the clockwork. You go with Descartes. God wound up the world, you know, the clockwork is doing its stuff, and he can't interfere with it, and it's too late, okay? 
There's another view of, of God which, has to, which is more organismic. The whole cosmos is, is God's body, if you will. It's God's organism. And so in the organism, cells are living and cells are dying. There is digestion, there is recycling, there is all kinds of things going on. And most of the time we like to speak of God as the one who brings on uh, creation, the creator, the sustainer. But the Hindus teach us something very deep. God is also the destroyer. And by that I mean the recycler. If people would never die, you know, then uh, we would never be able to grow. We'd hold on to the status quo of things. But the fact that everything has to turn, everything moves, everything is recycled. So the problem is that the Rambam and all the medieval philosophers like to look at the universe as a static building that doesn't shift and change. Okay? But you go back to the book of Kohelet, everything moves, a time for everything, turn, turn, turn. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and it keeps on shifting all the time, and gamze yavor, and nothing is eternal. So when we speak of God's eternity, we only are saying that whatever keeps on shifting and changing is God shifting and changing. That's eternal. But there is always time, space, all these uh, things that go into experience and reality. They're constantly in fluid. I'd like to read you a quote from your book, um, The New Jewish Spirit, Your Guide to the New Jewish Spirit. Talk um, louder, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, this is a quote from your book. Good. Um, Imagine a person who has a terrible life. Everything always goes wrong, and the person doesn't know where to turn or what to do. And in the midst of this comes the insight, the revelation, if you will, that the universe is not an accident, that everything going on in a person's life is part of the payment for wiping the person clean. Does that imply that when something goes wrong in someone's life, that it's punishment, in a sense? Well, let me say that the teaching of Gilgul says that you may be getting, in this life, something that's a payment, you know, a punishment for a past life. Um, it used to be uh, much more my, my thought than it is today. I don't quite think of it in, in this way, because as I was talking about pull and push, you know, when you talk punishment, you always say, you did this, and so it gets f comes from the past. But there is an element of things that we have to overcome, uh, uh, obstacles that are put in our path, if you will, where we have to overcome them because they will uh, bring us to a richer awareness than we have had before. And I don't think that anyone who has never had any tragic stuff in his life has ever gotten really mature about it. And here is where I would recommend to people to read Kohlberg and um, Fowler, uh, who follow the Rambam about the business of how people grow in moral development. Of course, when a child begins moral development, figures, if I do wrong, I get punished. If I do right, I get rewarded. Okay, But after a while, you you do right because it is right, and, and you avoid wrong because it's wrong. And from whom do we get the best message of what's right and what's wrong? From the universe itself. Many people think of God uh, being a legislator. And they think of mitzvahs and laws as if they were given, you know, imposed. And we have a whole history of that theory of law imposed, God holding the, the, the mountain over us, etc. But I believe that uh, what we have gotten in our tradition is what we have learned from interacting with the universe. That uh, if you rob, you're going to get robbed. If you hurt, you're going to get hurt. And so there is this karma is built into the universe. If you want to explain karma to a kid, you will say God will be angry. But if you grow up, i give you an example, a wonderful example. It used to be that people didn't like the second portion of the Shema. The Chara'af Hashem Bachem, God will be angry, and so on and so forth. And so the Reconstructionist, at one point, Professor Kaplan took it out of the sitter and put another portion in. It was very nice. 
now with the ecological stuff coming up with global warming and with the poisoning of atmosphere and so on and so forth, people brought it right back because <laughs> it's in front of our eyes. So what happens is it isn't what is, it's how it's expressed. And if you are on a more primitive level of uh, development, you will express it in terms of a big guy out there is going to get you if you do wrong. And if you're in a higher level of development, you recognize you're a cell in the body of God. You're a cell in the body of Gaia, of Earth. It's a different way of thinking, and that's why I'm saying paradigm shift, and that's the quote that you got was for that reason, yes. Um, Rosalind, you are a survivor of the Holocaust, is that correct? Well, I grew up in Austria, and I was born in Poland, and... Uh, in 1938, uh, we had to flee at the end after the uh, Kristallnacht from Vienna, and we uh, were bombed in, in Antwerp, and then we fled to France, and I was interned in two camps in France, and finally we made it to get Erif Pesach to come to the United States, to New York. And has that experience shaped your concept of God? There are some people who uh, don't want to ask questions about what was our contribution to the Holocaust. Okay? Same way as there are some people today who don't want to ask the question, what's our contribution to Intifada? Now, it's not our fault altogether that Intifada is here, but we made some contributions to that. And I think we made some contributions before. So you can't imagine that someone growing up like me shouldn't uh, sometimes think deeply about issues having to do about the Holocaust. When I lost my cousins and, and, and many, many friends uh, uh, in Auschwitz and other people. My, my grandfather was a Scheuchet in Auschwitz, which was named Auschwitz by the Germans. So my uncle went back there be, from Vienna because he didn't want to uh, stay longer in, in Austria, and never you got killed. So, of course, I think about Holocaust. But my sense is that this is not my job. There are some people like Elie Wiesel who has to remind us not to forget, you know? And like uh, Emil Fackenheim, Oliver Scholem, who would say, don't give Hitler the final victory. And I think these are important statements. But that hasn't been my task. My task has been to bridge and to bring us closer to a future. What can we say about the nature of God, if anything? Mm. It's so wonderful that we are blessed to have Kabbalah. Because when you're dealing with philosophy, then you get to the place, the nature of God is this, nature of God is that. It's almost like saying, what color does God have, you know? So people want to say, this is more blue. Or Before, they didn't even think of color. They did black and white, you know? Once I got to feel color, that's why I made the talis with the, the rainbow colors going according to a spectrum, you know? But the the truth is, that uh, when we are, how would I put it, looking at qualities of God, we have qualities. Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, Vechanun, Er Chapaim, Rav Chesed, Ve'emet, and we experience that. But we also experience Venake, Lo Yenake, you know? We experience that too. You don't get away in this universe without somehow uh, bringing about the equalization of things. So, when the Kabbalists are saying that God has Keter, Chochma, Bina, Gdad, Chesed, Gura, Tiferet, these are not the qualities of Ein Sof, because Ein Sof is beyond qualities. But when we speak of God becoming involved and in relating to the universe, that's when we speak of qualities. So we say, Chesed, God is kind, the first day of creation. Gevura, the second day of creation, makes make separations. 
Then comes Tiferet, Rachamim, and it's the third day of creation. And you have Kitov two times, you know. And so, do you understand what I'm saying? It, it doesn't have the sense of one quality only. It has a sense that there are these multiple, we discern qualities in God. Uh, but what we are doing is we are projecting our experience and know-how that God must have at least that. There are some people who don't want to believe God is conscious, for instance. And I say to them, Binu bo'arim ba'am, like it says in Tehillim. Uchsilim matay taskilu. When are you going to get seichel? Hanota ozen ha lo yishma? The one who creates an ear, will he not hear? Im yotzer ayin ha lo yabit? Is he not going to see if he creates an eye? And so if, there's, if we have consciousness, it is consciousness that creates our consciousness. And so, therefore, I want to say that qualities are projections from our experience on the infinite, but they also give us a good part. Because if I can say that God has chesed, I can relate to God in a loving way. If I say God has gevur, I can relate to God in awe, in yira. And so each of the qualities that I project on God come back to me in my relationship. And that's what I call the brit, the covenant that we have. We bespeak God, you know, atem he martem, and then he says, Hashem he emircha. So God bespeaks us, we bespeak God, and in this dialogue and covenant is our relationship with God. Um, I do want to go back to the relationship with God. Pardon? I would like to go back to the relationship with God issue um, in a little bit. Okay. I'd like to ask about the unity of God. Because um, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier that God is a part of all things. God isn't something mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have this concept of, I mean, projected, but, but still, you know, different attributes of God. How, what, how is this unified? What do you mean that God is one? As you were talking right now, you're using both hands, you know? <laughs> and still you're Sarah. I'm using both hands, still I'm Simon. The, the, the multiplicity, uh, the range in which uh, when I say God is Ein Sof, so there is no end to the operations, to the multiplicity that is in God. But let me say something that will make sense. We use the word universe, you know? The word universe is a funny word. It has two polarities. It has one polarity that goes to the uni, another polarity that goes to the verse. When we are looking for the one, we go to the uni. When we look to diversity, we go to the verse. But the universe contains the one and the many and the many and the one. When in, in Kabbalah we say, Echad Yachidum Yuchad, you know, he is one, he is the only one, and he is the unified one. And we, that's why we don't want to say, how would I put it, the word Achdut, you know, combines all these things. Um, also another quote from your book. You say, God is internalized in our souls and our consciousness. God is projected externally onto the cosmos. God is imminent. God is manifest. But what God is like is up to each soul to decide. Mm -hmm. So are we each allowed to determine? Do we each have a different God? Or is it one God that works? <laughs> See, it keeps coming back again to the same thing. It isn't a, que it isn't a question so much that we decide. Give you, give you an example. Um, You've come here, you're doing this work with me, okay? I'm relating to you. At this point, the Zalman whom you are meeting is not the Zalman that my wife meets or my children meet. So, am I different Zalmans? Different aspects, different tangents, different relationships. The differences uh, that are there come out of the one of the oneness that is there so if you are saying do we have different gods no but we have different relationships with god and once this is understood that's different than the medieval period then we can say christians have a different relationship with god muslims have a different relationship with god you know that's a whole other way of looking at it um, you talk about um, a distinction between God as a noun and God as a verb. Could you explain that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. When I don't like, f for instance, the word Jew as a noun. Uh, 
because what it says is it doesn't tell me anything. I have to look at, for instance, if I have three bins, one says Catholic, Protestant, Jew, then I know what you mean by Jew. You mean religion. If one of them says uh, uh, Negro, a Caucasian, Jew, then I know you, uh, uh, you mean race, you know? You say Pole, Russian, Jew, then I know you mean nationality. But by itself, it is an object, and I'm not an object. On the other hand, if you ask, for instance, uh, when am I a Jew? When I'm Jewing, you know? So I like the verb. And Hebrew is a verb language. And the name yud hey vav hey is a name of the constant inging of, of the presence of God. Now, if you say, uh, who is God? What is God? Then you always get back, show me the object. But if I say, God is a godding, an infinite godding, then uh, wherever you go, aha, God is now godding as this light, God is godding as this ceiling. That's a whole different way of approaching. And that's why I think we are, our mind is in galut, in exile, by the European languages, because Hebrew is a verb language and it always likes to think of these things as verbs. Um, in Tanakh, we encounter descriptions of God, um, descriptions which don't really jive so well with your own conception of what, your own concept of what God is. How do you reconcile that? That's very simple, because there are times, you know, when you talk to a child and you say, God is watching and he's out there, you know? And that makes him think that God is moving around and so on. You call that deism. And in, in the last chapters of Paradigm Shift, I talk about that. There is later on a shift from the Tanakh language to the way the Targum translates it. And the Targum no longer says God went down on Mount, Mount Sinai, but says God manifested. Because God was there before, but more hidden, and now God manifests. Understand? They don't have God moving around. And so, we learned first that nothing can compare with God. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Then we learned, nothing can exist without God giving it life. Now we learn, nothing else exists except God. It's a pantheistic notion. You couldn't possibly have pantheism at the beginning if you didn't go through the stages. So what you show me is that certain stages in Tanakh were more primitive than others. And that's true because by the time you get to Eov, you know, and you get to Kohelet, there's a different way of understanding how God works with the universe. Um, just this is, before I forget to ask this, how central is God to your Jew Judaism, your commitment to being a Jew, to your Jewish ideology? Why should I answer your question if it isn't for God? Why should I bother even saying to you on the telephone, come and do that? You know, uh, there is a shiviti Hashem l'negdi tamid. I can't imagine myself um, uh, in a day without reaching out for God within me and to God and in prayer and so on and so forth. I, I, you know, it's like, <laughs> when you say how essential it is, you know, I'm less essential to me than God is essential to me. Why do we have so many names for God? Uh, I hope that somebody loves you and will call you by all kinds of nice names, you know? And uh, w what can you do? Each name says something, how you feel. I can tell you a story. The Kozhenitsa Magit was a very holy person, a disciple of Rebbe Limelech of Lizhensk. And uh, he lived in Poland. Kozhenitz is in the center of Poland. One day he looks out of the window in his uh, Stiebele when a, a Polish lad and a girl are walking by and he says to her, Kochani Mumoy, which means, my beloved, my darling. So he picks that up 
And a few days later, in the middle of Davin, it comes out of, oh, <laughs> you know? So it's not the same name of Yud Hei Vav Hei and uh, Adonai, you know? But he had, there was a moment that he felt like there's this spiritual, every time I feel that feeling moving in my heart, I will pray. You know, he had, he had that feeling. And there was this Polish phrase that really, help them say that. So, names. We have all the names because when we call on that name, that connection with that Mida of God gets vitalized. You know, it's like a, a, a screen name, you know, a, a password, and now you get connected with that Mida, and then you get connected with the other. This may not be applicable because your your concept of God is not something out there. But do you have a picture of God? I mean, if God is in all things, can you when you dive in, do you picture a book, the telephone, <laughs> your wife, or yeah. nothingness, like? Well, let me tell you. Uh, when I was young, I had a sense of God being like Rabbi Yossel uh, was a nice old man in shul who smiled and he gave kids candy and so on and so forth. So I figured that God must be like Rabbi Yossel Reiser, but only more so, you know? Later on, when I was um, in the yeshiva in Lubavitch, and I would look at my Rebbe, and I would have such a sense of uh, if there was ever a human uh, being modeling what it is to be God in a body, I would think my Rebbe was modeling that, you know? Now, there were times when I had the sense of God as a mother. And uh, there you have, there's an image that comes from uh, um, paganism, if you will, from uh, polytheism, that has a picture, an image of Diana. And she has oodles and oodles of breasts, and she's feeding the whole the whole universe, you know? Uh, it depends. Uh, but I, I like an image for my heart. I don't like an image for my head. My head says God has no image, you know? Once William James was interviewing some people in New England, and he asked this man, tell me, uh, when you pray, what do you place yourself in front of? And the guy says, an oblong blur, you know? I don't like to talk to an oblong blur. So when I get to the place of the friendship of God, and that's why we say Avinu Avarachaman, you know, and we come up with all those names and relationships, and these are called root metaphors, the basic ways in which we relate. 